let's open up in prayer and let's uh, thank the Lord for his presence here today and thank the Lord for continuing to do a mighty work in our lives. So, dear Father in heaven, please forgive us of our sins as we come to your throne of grace, Father, with a righteous mind and a righteous heart. Lord God in heaven, you are deserving of all our glory. You are deserving of all glory, Father. You are deserving of all things. But we just thank you for your presence, Father. We thank you for working in us, changing our lives, Father, to be more of who you are, Lord God in heaven. We thank you for working through us, Lord God in heaven, to display your love to others, to those who are hurting, to those who are lost, Father God in heaven, to those who don't know you. Jesus, we just want to share your love with everybody we come in contact with. I pray, Father God in heaven, that you would just give us opportunity after opportunity to share your love and your grace and your mercy with others and point every soul to you, Father God in heaven, and the work that you do and the reason why you died on the cross for us, Father God in heaven. This week is a special week, and we know that the enemy hates this time because the spotlight is shining so brightly on you, as it should through all times of the year, Father God in heaven. But we just want to reverence you. We want to lift you, Father. We want to put you first in our lives. We want to adore you and love you as you love us, Father God in heaven. And we just thank you, Jesus, for being in our lives, for working in our lives, for molding us into your likeness. And we just we just praise your holy name, Father God, and your Son, Jesus. We just love you with all our hearts, minds, and soul, and strength. And we just thank you, thank you, thank you, Father, in your mighty name, Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So, we're going to pick up where we left off in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. Last week, we started uh, the first part of a two-part message called God's Blueprint of the Perfect Sacrifice. And last week, we covered... Hebrews chapter 9, verses 25 through 28, this week. Oh, I'm sorry. Verses 23 through 25 last week. This week, we're going to cover verses 26 through 28. So, um, it's the second part of the perfect sacrifice and God's blueprint of the perfect sacrifice. And we picked up where we were learning that, you know, through the blood sacrifice, you know, to cleanse the tabernacle, it was necessary. It was necessary to sprinkle um, the high priest and the people, the worshipers, with, with the blood. But what we did learn is that uh, through the, the blood of the animal sacrifices, we still could not be atoned for our sins or forgiven of our sins. Although the Day of Atonement was supposed to do that, it was only through the blood of Jesus that we could accomplish that. And that is why God brought the New Covenant, because God knew we needed one and only one sacrifice through His Son, through His blood, to atone for our sins once and for all, to never have to go through the blood rituals again and to sacrifice animals day in and day out, and then go through that atonement once a year. Because God knew that the first covenant was incomplete. But through the act of the cross and Jesus, obedience and faith, God brought us the new covenant. And we spent a lot of time the past month or so, talking about the new covenant, talking about how great Jesus is, how great of a high priest he is. He was greater than the angels. He's greater than Moses. 
He's greater than the heavens. He's greater than Joshua. He was greater than Melchizedek. And we know that the earthly sanctuary was a building that God instructed Moses to build, the tabernacle. And Jesus, we know, we learned last week, never stepped foot in the Holy of Holies in the earthly tabernacle because when he died on the cross, he was immediately in the presence of God, taking his place at the right hand of his Father. And we're going to pick up on that uh, theme today and really solidify why he is the perfect sacrifice. And the nice thing about it in chapter 10, this is actually the end of chapter 9, and we're going to move into chapter 10. And chapter 10 really creates a substantial argument or substantiates the claims in chapter 9. So it's a continuation of what we're talking about here. But we really bring home the fact that Jesus is the only way to his Father. If you remember John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And that is the case. And that is what the Hebrew author was facing. Remember, the Jewish, the Hebrew Jew, the Hebrew Christian, was giving their life to Christ at that point. And at first, they were suffering persecutions. And because of it, remember, it was blasphemy to come against God in that way and believe that the Messiah was there. So they were getting persecuted. And at first, they were okay with the persecution. But as time goes on and the persecution stepped up, there were a lot of Hebrew Christians that were rethinking their uh, act of accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as a Messiah. There was a lot of downward pressure. There was a lot of societal pressure, a lot of religious pressure, a lot of even political pressure on them to rethink that Jesus is the real king. He's a real Messiah. So they were starting to waver. And this is where the book of Hebrews comes in, and the author has to remind them as background that Jesus is the only one. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And through him, we will find his Father in the kingdom of heaven, both him and his Father. The Bible teaches us that when we get into heaven, when God finally calls us home, we will see Jesus and his Father sitting in the throne of heaven. Running from that throne is the river of life. And it's going to be an awesome, awesome time. And this is what we have to prepare for. We have to prepare today or tomorrow. I had a conversation yesterday where... Someone was so worried about today, they didn't want to think about tomorrow or eternity. And quickly, we have to correct that thought process, you know, in love. And speaking to them on how important it is to think about your eternal life and think about where you are going to end up for eternity. We've talked about this many, many times. There's only two places you're going to go in the lake of fire or you're going to go into the heavenly realm and live with the Lord Jesus Christ. Both places you will find for eternity. But if you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you will find our heavenly home. If you are a non-believer and you reject Christ, you will find a fiery home in the lake of fire. So, you know, we have to be able to be ready to tell people when they are not preparing for the future, what it is going to cost them. And of course we do it in love. Of course we do it with the understanding that they may not fully understand what we're saying. 
you know, new Christians are an interesting group. We were all new Christians at one time. And just remember what our thought process was at the time. Remember how on fire we were. Remember how much we wanted or how hard we wanted to work to get into heaven. Only to be reminded, the only work that's required from us once we receive the Lord Jesus Christ is developing that personal relationship with God. And there are some out there that maybe uh, accepted the Lord, but wanted to take their time in developing that relationship. And that's why God is so patient and long-suffering, because he will wait and wait and wait. And he knows. He knows that once we receive him, it's hard to reject him. So at that point, God knew. God knew from the very beginning of time that his son, Jesus Christ, would have to die on the cross and have to be the perfect sacrifice. And he had to make it easy for us not to go through these rituals of, of blood sacrifices with animals that his son would be the final sacrifice that through the blood of his son, our sins would be forgiven. And we, our salvation would be secure. And we learned that last week. You know, uh, we learned that through Christ's blood, the heavenly tabernacle has been cleansed once and for all. No more cleansing of the heavenly, of the earthly tabernacle, but through Christ's blood, even the heavenly tabernacle is fulfilled. And that's God's perfect plan. Jesus had to do it once. There is no more daily, you know, multiple time a day rituals. One time a year, the atonement for our sins. There's no more of that. There's no need with the Messiah. This week is a continuation of the message. It was impractical. It is impractical to have to do those blood sacrifices daily. And we don't need to do that anymore. And then we're going to learn today that after our first death, judgment is going to come. And why does a Hebrew author remind us of that after the first death is very specific because we learn in the Bible that a non-believer will suffer two deaths. A believer will suffer one death. And we will live for eternity because God conquers death. Through the blood of Jesus, Jesus has conquered death. Remember, the Bible teaches us that in God's judgment, his final judgment, he throws death and Hades into the lake of fire. So we will not experience that second death. And this is what the Hebrew author is trying to remind us of. We will all, all, all suffer a physical death. That's God's plan for us. Our bodies will stop functioning. We will pass away. There will be judgment. Remember what Paul teaches us, absence from the body, presence in the Lord, presence on that judgment seat. And the questions that we're going to try to address are what are we doing today to prepare ourselves to sit on that judgment seat? But this message is going to focus on there will be a judgment through the blood of Jesus. It create God created that place for us. So let's pick up where we left off last week. Let's um, get into Hebrews chapter 9, verses 26 through 28, God's blueprint of the perfect sacrifice. So do you know how many deaths you will suffer? According to scripture, I sure hope you do now because I just let the cat out of the bag. 
What prevents you from suffering more than one death? That should be obvious also. It's your acceptance and belief in living the life Christ has given you for him. Did Christ die for all or only a few? <coughs> Excuse me. And that's a very interesting question, and there's a lot of debate on did die, Christ die for the few or for all. I firmly believe that Christ died for all of us. And through Christ's death and through the new covenant, we all have an opportunity to receive him and live in the kingdom of heaven. So my answer to that question is, Christ died for us all. But you have to believe. You have to become a believer. You have to start living that life that Christ has given you. How do you know Christ died for you? How do you know Christ died? If you read the Bible, it will tell you precisely how Christ died. It gives endpoints on when the crucifixion started and when the crucifixion ended. So it gives us a good snapshot in time on Christ dying. Now, how does you know, how do you know that Christ died for you and I? Because we've been learning this. The Hebrew author has been taking us through this journey of how much greater Christ is and why Christ is the only great high priest. And God tells us in his word, and, and just everybody knows this. For God so loved the world, he gave his only forgotten son. John 3, 16. Uh, I said forgotten, begotten. I'm so sorry. So God reminds us through many, many scripture, but the one that sticks out the most is John 3.16. God gave his only begotten son for you and I because he loved us so much. That's how we know. How are you preparing your life today for judgment after the first death? What are you doing to prepare yourself? Some people will say, well, you know what? I've accepted Christ. I don't have to do anything. My salvation is free. Grace is free. Absolutely, grace and salvation are free to you. But the price was paid by our Lord Jesus Christ. But again, let me remind you that there are actions that we have to take. We have to want to develop a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It just can't stop at you know, I gave my life to Christ. I'm done. I'm done with him. I'm done with this Christianity. That's not how it works. When you give your life to Christ, you are now a part of the kingdom of heaven, part of the body of Christ. And Jesus sets expectations for us to love one another, to help out one another. To learn who he is. To develop a close personal relationship with him. So when we do get to that final judgment seat after our first death, we can rejoice in what we've done with the Lord Jesus Christ during our earthly walk. So what are you doing to prepare? Are you in your Bible every day? Are, in, are you in your word? Are you meditating on the Lord? Are you trying to separate yourself from what the world has to offer? Are you trying to live a godly life? Are you loving others as God teaches us to love? 
as God loves us? Are you dying to yourself? Are you dying to this world as Jesus died to the world? Do you believe these things that the Bible teaches us? Do you believe that the Word of God is inerrant in the Holy Bible? And every word in the Bible is inspired by God himself. Those are the things that you need to start thinking about and believing to start preparing yourself for final judgment. If you are compromising, if you are compromising in your faith, if you're compromising in the world and giving the world pleasure, then you need to think about where you're at and what you are actually doing to prepare yourself. Again, some people will believe just receiving the Lord Jesus Christ is enough, but Jesus wants a, a personal relationship with us. I'll give you the example of a, a, a couple who wants to get married. You don't just introduce yourself and then go away for a year and then come back and, you know, set the wedding date and then come back a year later, never talking to your spouse or trying to develop a relationship and say, okay, we're married. Because you know what? You'll be in for some big surprises. Maybe the bride or the groom doesn't like you. But if you think about if you did that with the Lord Jesus Christ, you accept him, but you never talk to him. You never open up your Bible. You never put him first in your life. And then one day he calls you home and you're on a judgment seat. And you don't know anything about him. It's equivalent. The relationships that we build on earth, God expects us to build that same relationship with him and his son. That is why God brought the new covenant so we could have close personal access to God. Remember, in the old covenant, it was limited access through the tabernacle. Remember, two rooms in the tabernacle, the sanctuary and the Holy of Holies. To get to the Holy of Holies, you had to go through the sanctuary. But guess what? You are not allowed in the Holy of Holies. So there was limited access to God. God, through the new covenant, through his son, gave us direct access. And that's a point that we always have to remember, that we now have direct access to, to Christ. So last question, what more can, you, can Christ do for you? before you reciprocate his love, before you multiply his love. What more can Christ do for you? What more can God do for you? Is there anything else? Is there one more thing that you're telling yourself, God, if you do this one more last thing for me, I'm going to give my whole life to you. I promise. Are you one of those? Because I will tell you, God knows every thought you have, and he knows your heart. And when you make an empty promise to God, be careful. We all should be careful. We all should be sincere when we go to God, when we speak to him, when we cry out to him, when we pray to him. We need to pray with a sincerity. We need to go to him believing and having faith that God will work in our lives. He'll work through our lives. And this is what we have to really start to focus on as we develop our life with Christ. You know, stay focused on him. Put God and Jesus first in your life. Be strong in the Lord. Because when you are strong in the Lord, you are going to be weak in the world. And that's exactly where God wants you. Strong in him, weak in this world. And then when we are weak, the Lord is strong in us.
and that's how we will grow. And that's God's plan. And that's God's perfect blueprint for the perfect sacrifice. His son, Jesus Christ, was without sin. His son, Jesus Christ, was, is, without sin. The only time he ever felt sin was on that cross. But he was able to overcome it through his faith, through his obedience, and through his love for his Father. He did it, and he overcame it. And now he sits at the right hand of his Father, where we as believers, when we get to that place called heaven, will be reverencing him and his Father. So, with that said, let's uh, pick up in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26 through 28. And again, this is the closeout of this chapter. And let's just read. So, Hebrews 9, 26, Then he, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 27, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So I read 27 and 28 together because they really do go together there. So let me just separate verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for our salvation. So guess what? There's another reason why Christ went to the cross. Because to, get, to provide our salvation. So let's look at 26. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now at once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Why would God, and this is a question that we have to ask ourselves, God loves us so much, God loves his son so much, why would God put Jesus through the daily sacrifices, the yearly sacrifice, over and over and over and over again, if he proclaims, proclaims to love him? And I'll ask the question like this, why would God allow us to suffer over and over and over and over again if he loves us, if we love him? God will not. But every time we go through a trial or tribulation, we have to learn what God is trying to teach us. We have to recognize God is trying to mold us. He's trying to make us a better person. And he's not going to sacrifice us over and over and over again, just like he will not sacrifice his son over and over and over again. Could you imagine what that would be like? Could you imagine for the Lord Jesus Christ what that would be like? Over time, it would be diminished. There would be diminishing returns. It's called sensitization we would be overly sensitized to that act, and it would be meaningless. But because God knew that it only had to occur once, the profound impact on our lives will be much greater because we know that one act provides our salvation, provides our pathway, our doorway, our gate into the kingdom of heaven. You know, when he talks about at the end of the ages, it's the end of our ages. You know, there are two things that could be addressed here. It's the end of time, you know, God's final judgment, and it could be the end of our ages, the end of our lives. He 
He has appeared to put away the sin by the sacrifice of himself. Again, you know, the new covenant was incomplete, or the old covenant was incomplete. The new covenant is complete now. Through those sins. And let's look at 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also, also, let me start again. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And I mentioned this to someone yesterday. Do you realize that the same Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that God left behind to guide us, to live in us? So if God can use His Spirit to raise Jesus from the dead, what can that Spirit do in our lives? When we cry out to God, when we call to God, when we lay our burdens at God's feet, What can God do through his Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead? Is the same Spirit that dwells in us, in God's tabernacle, in us. We are God's tabernacle now. Because that Holy Spirit, God the Father, Jesus the Son, live in us when we believe. And Peter's right. He suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. What does he mean, the just for the unjust? Jesus is righteous. He was without sin. Who is the unjust here? Peter's talking about us. We are unrighteous. But God loved us so much, he gave his son to make us righteous. I'll remind you over and over and over and over of this. In the kingdom of heaven, God is righteous. There will be no sin in heaven. In order for us to get into heaven, we must allow Jesus through the Holy Spirit to cleanse us so we can become sinless also in the kingdom of heaven. It tells us, the Bible teaches us, there is no sin in heaven. If there is no sin in heaven, God is not going to allow us to take that sin with us. So you're better to prepare yourself today to ask for forgiveness of our sins, to seek forgiveness who, from those who sin against us, to repent of our sins, to continue to move forward and try to separate ourselves from the world. Jesus was in the flesh when he was put to death. He bled. The Bible teaches us and tells us that Jesus bled. The Bible tells us Jesus' flesh was split open when he was scourged. The Bible also tells us he cried out on the cross. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Why have you forsaken me? God, why have you forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And he wasn't saying that because he felt God was forsaking him. He felt the separation when the sin was pouring in him. He no longer could feel God's presence at that moment. And remember, as a sin was pouring into him, Jesus was without sin. He was feeling this sin for the very first time. He had no idea. But God, as awesome as he is, brought this man Jesus to the cross so he could relate to us and feel what we felt, so he could properly minister to us and develop that close personal relationship. That's what's so important about this. That's why it's important to believe that Christ did die for you and for me and for all 
those who are unrighteous, which is all of us. There is not one infallible being on this planet. We all have faults. We all have sin in our lives. And Jesus came. He received those sins. And he felt uh, that moment of separation between him and his father because his father is righteous. And if his father was in heaven at that moment, there is no sin in heaven and there had to be a separation. Let's look at 1 John 3, 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him, there is no sin. Remember that. It's so important to remember that Jesus went to the cross sinless. And there, there's a lot of stories, a lot of debate on whether, you know, Jesus did X, Y, or Z. But you know what? The Bible teaches us this, that he had no sin. His relationships were spiritual. Yes, this human side of him, there was relationships, but friendly, platonic relationships, because Jesus was also the Son of God. So, Jesus was alive in spirit. He was sinless. God brought him, manifest him to that point to establish a new covenant with God's children, with the world, and for those who want to receive him and accept him as Lord Jesus and accept God the Father. Let's look at uh, 927. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this judgment, we're all going to be judged. I mentioned this earlier, but what are you going to say on the judgment seat? What argument can you ever come up with that will be good enough to tell the Lord you did nothing with the gift that God has given you, His Son, Jesus Christ? Can you tell God you were too busy? Can you tell God that, you know, your plate was so full, you didn't have time? Your work was so important, your children are so important, your family is so important. I am not downplaying the importance of family or your children. But God puts a hierarchy on his importance, and it's God first. Family, second. Everything else below that, prioritize appropriately. But when we put God first, we are living now the life that God has given us. We have to remember that. We need to be like Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.10. says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, Paul is telling us whether you're good or bad, you will be on the judgment seat. And what he's saying is, what have we done in our, our body? What have we done in the body of Christ? But we are all going to appear. So what are you doing today to prepare for that judgment? Excuse me. And you don't have to answer that out loud. But let your heart speak to you. Let your heart guide you. What are you doing to prepare yourself? It's very profound, and, and I find it interesting 
but not surprising that there are a lot of people out there that don't think about their eternal life because they are so busy trying to figure out life on earth. And yes, we must live an abundant life on earth, but that includes living with Christ. Yes, there are certain things we have to do, like eat and live and, you know, eat and live <laughs> to survive in the world. But I will guarantee you this, eating and living with the Lord Jesus Christ takes a lot of stress and strain off of us because we put all of our burdens, we lay them all at the feet of Jesus. And he provides for us. He will provide knowledge and wisdom if we go to him in our decision-making process for the decisions that we have to make. If we go to him on every decision, every decision, if we wait on God, will be a perfect resolution. When we don't wait, when we're impatient, we will certainly mess up God's timeline. We will never mess up God's plan, but we will mess up the timeline because we will interject ourselves. And the things that God, that God is working in background, the things that God is working on, the people that God is trying to bless along with us in every circumstance, we'll just mess up. So we have to be cautious. That's why it's so important Hear me, so important that we put God first in every decision we make for everything that we're doing. It's so important. Look at 1 John 4, 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. And John is not telling us, you know, we live in this world, be in the world be of the world. John is saying because Jesus is, so are we in this world. If he is holy and righteous, then so should we try to be holy and righteous. I know every time you say, well, Jesus would do this, you get the retort, well, I'm not Jesus. Jesus was perfect, of course. But we strive to be like him, right? Jesus, when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ, we strive to be who Jesus is. And as long as we're trying to be like him, of course we're not going to be Jesus. Of course we're not going to be God. There's only one. There's only one triune God. And we will never, ever reach the point where we can see eye to eye. And what I mean by that, be on the same level, physically looking eye to eye. That will not happen with us. God is God. Jesus is his son. We're way, way down somewhere in that hierarchy. But we are heirs and we are children. And God loves us. And we have to stay focused on that. And stay focused on preparing ourselves because God gave us the perfect sacrifice. He gave us a means to our eternal ends. And that's living in the kingdom of heaven. And the means is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we just keep that focused in our lives, all these problems that come at us, they'll, they'll still come. But the way we deal with them, the way we respond to the problems will be much different because of our faith, because of our obedience, because we love Jesus. Jesus loves us. We love God. God loves us. And God promises to protect us, to provide for us, to love us, to care for us. If we believe that with all our hearts, then handing over our problems to them should be very easy. And let God deal with them. Let God work them out. We should not be sweating this small stuff. We should not be sweating the big stuff. In reality, we should not be sweating. But we do because we're human. 
So it's important to remember when we're going through a trial, when we're going through a tribulation, when we're going through heartache, when we're going through pain, hand it to God. Let God deal with it. Let his son, whom died on a cross for us, deal with it. That's all we can do. Band together and seek prayer. Pray. Seek God's word. That's all we can do. If you know somebody's hurting, stop what you're doing and pray for them. Let them know that you're praying for them. I will tell you, it is so powerful to know that people are praying for you in masses. Because what that shows is the love of God that is in them, that is being poured out to you. They're taking their time to put you on a petition and putting that before God. How, more, how much more privileged can we be than to know that we have a body of Christ praying and seeking righteousness on our behalf, seeking healing, seeking spiritual healing, physical healing, financial healing, going to the Father on our behalf. It's an awesome, awesome feeling. And it makes us feel good. And it should, because God loves you. Jesus loves you. He gave his life. He's the perfect sacrifice for it. Let's look at verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. We've heard this over and over again. Jesus died once for our sins, once and for all. But you know what? It needs to sink in. And if it's sunk in, you need to spread that word, that good news. <laughs> because you know what? The best thing that we can do is share that news with others who are hurting. And you know what? We just went through a very hurtful time in society across the globe, not just this nation. And you know what? If we do not course correct, if we do not put God first in this nation once again, and if we keep trying to strip God out of the town square, of the public square, of the government buildings, of our lives, of our children's lives. There will be a judgment. Again, remember what Paul taught us. We will all be on that judgment seat. And complacency isn't a good excuse. And waiting for your neighbor isn't a good excuse when you're on that judgment seat. So what are you doing to prepare your life today for that moment you're going to be on the judgment seat, praying that you get into the kingdom of heaven? God is a righteous God. His son is a righteous man. Son. So what are you doing? Romans 6.10, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And look at that last part of this verse that Paul is teaching us. He lives to God. The life that he lives. So the life that we live, should we should be living to God or God. If we are to be like Jesus, we should live like Jesus. Yes, there are a lot of obstacles in this world to overcome, but you know what? Through the strength and power of the Holy Spirit, of Jesus Christ, of His Father in our lives, we can overcome this world, and we can be separated from the world. Again, for the death that He died, He died to sin once for all. The life He lives, He lives to God.
1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for the righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Again, how do we know Jesus hung on a tree? And really, what Peter is saying here is he hung on a cross. The cross was wooden. Peter uses the term tree here. It really means a cross. Having died to sins, might live for righteousness. That we can die to the sinful life, the sinful nature, that we may live for righteousness. And you know, it's through those stripes. And, and you know, what is Peter talking about the stripes here? It's the lashings. It's through the beatings, discouraging, that Jesus suffered. Remember, there was not just hanging on a cross that Jesus suffered, but it was the pre cross hanging that Jesus also have to, had to suffer. The humiliation of being laughed at, of being called a pretend king to put the throne of, ro of thorns on your head. They put a purple cloth on him. And then they laughed at him. You want to be a king here? Here's your crown. Here's your cape. And then they beat him. And then he had to carry his cross all the way to the Hill of Skulls and then hang there. And he did that because he loves us. He did that because he loves his father. He did that because he was righteous. He did that because he was obedient. These are the things that we need to internalize. What more can Jesus do for you? To provide your path to the kingdom of heaven. It's a simple action. It's a simple call to action. I want to change my life. I want to live for you, Jesus Christ. I want to give my whole life to you. That's the call. That's our action. And then start living it. Start allowing the Holy Spirit, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, to sanctify your life. To develop a righteous life. To start separating yourself from the world. To become sinless. On that judgment seat. That's why it's always a good habit when you are praying to seek forgiveness from the Lord of your sins. So you may approach the throne of grace with a righteous heart and a righteous mind. It's easy. They're easy words. Lord, forgive me of my sins. You say it enough, you believe it. You believe it enough, you start to live it. You believe it enough, you start to teach it. Because Jesus hung on the tree. That we may become righteous. That we may become sinless. Is it an easy road? No. Does it take the strength of us? We don't have that strength. But it does take the strength and power of God, His Son, and the Holy Spirit to keep us on that path of righteousness, to make sure that we have a place to go when we sin. That's what God did. That's why Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. He was sinless when He went to the cross. That is why Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. And that's what 
we have to continuously remind ourselves of that he is the perfect sacrifice. And through him, we can find that kingdom. Let's look at Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly, eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are no longer citizens of the world, which is beautiful. When you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't get whisked away. Obviously, there are so many pastors, there are so many congregants in this world that have accepted and lived their life for Christ. So many missionaries that live their life for Christ. We're still here. We still have to be of the world. We have to be the light. We have to be the salt. We have to be the ones to remind the lost and remind ourselves and exhort ourselves when we're fallen, when sin is pouring in. We have to be the ones standing in the gap for each other. Although our ultimate citizenship is now in the kingdom of heaven, we no longer need a passport because to get to heaven because our, we are citizens. We've made the oath, the oath of giving our life to Christ. And remember, when we started Hebrews, how important was an oath to God? How important in the first century in B.C. was an oath important? Oaths could not be broken. That's why God, in Psalm 110.4, made an oath that he would be with us forever. And he would bless. It's so important that when we become citizens, you know, if you become a citizen of the United States, you have to take an oath. You have to swear the oath that you will uphold the laws of the United States. You won't come against the government. And there are many other things that you have to say. But taking the oath to become a citizen in heaven requires one thing, your heart. It requires acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. Let's look at some encouraging verses here. Isaiah 53, 12, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah is talking about Jesus here. He's talking about when he was on a cross that the guards were taking his garments and they were drawing straws to see who would get their, his garments, the garments of Jesus, until they realized Jesus was the Son of God. Then it meant something different to them. But I will tell you this, he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He poured out his soul unto death. In his three-year ministry, he taught and taught and taught. His whole objective was to expose his father to the world and that personal relationship that he could have with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And to convince that through the Lord Jesus Christ, we will find our seat in heaven. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, 7. So that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the re, uh, revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need to bring gifts. We just need to bring our hearts. We need to bring our minds. And when we find the revelation of who Christ is, we will be extremely satisfied knowing that Christ is the perfect sacrifice. 
He was sinless. He was obedient. He was full of love. He was full of love of his Father that it poured out through him to us. That's what's critical. And there's nothing that we can give God or Jesus except our obedience, our faith, and in our lives, and our commitment to live for him. So we may find that seed in heaven. So let's, uh, let's conclude. You know, have you ever done something in someone's life that is so profound it changed that person's life forever? You know, Jesus did. He died on the cross and it changed our lives forever. If we accept him, if we receive him. When Christ died on the cross for us, he changed our lives for eternity. Jesus provided a path to salvation. And in his second coming, we'll see him on the judgment seat. Do not think because you are not a Christian that you will not see God on the judgment seat because the Bible teaches us we will all see him no matter what our relationship is with him. 1 Corinthians reminds us of that. We will all be on the judgment seat, good or bad. To be assured that Jesus Christ was not paid in vain, we must try to live our life with him now. You start now because the end is going to be awesome. If you read Revelation 21, you will find out exactly how heaven looks and what our lives will be like in heaven. And then continue that on into Revelation 22, 1 through 5. It shows us exactly what we are going to expect. Look at Titus 2, 13 and 14, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. His own special people, zealous for good works, that is us. We are the ones that should have that zeal to work for Christ. We are the ones who should be spreading the good works of who Jesus Christ is, reminding people when you're downtrodden, when you need someone to lift you, it is the Lord Jesus Christ that can do that for you. It is through our obedience and through our love of God that God's love will be shared throughout this nation. It is through our obedience, through our faith, through God's love in us that people can feel love again. And that's what Titus is telling us here. God wants his own special people. We will be his own special people. And in the Bible, it tells us when we're in heaven, we're going to be saints, we're going to be priests, we're going to be servants. But we are going to reverence God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit for eternity. There'll be no tabernacles in heaven. Heaven is the tabernacle. There'll be no separate rooms, no sanctuary that you have to go through, no holy of holies. It will all be there for us. Over 2 billion cubic miles. The Bible describes the new Jerusalem being. And it is going to be amazing, amazing, amazing. It says if we start to walk with Christ, if we show Jesus that we love him more than the world, than we love the world, it will change our lives forever. There are many good people in the world, but unfortunately, being good alone is not good enough to get you into heaven. Let me say that again. Being good in this world alone is not good enough to get you into heaven. What is the action? Receive Christ. Repent your sins. Seek forgiveness of the sins that you commit. Seek forgiveness for those who sin against you. And really forgive those 
who sin against you. God desires us to develop a relationship with him on this earth. We must allow the Holy Spirit to live within us and live a godly life. We must be diligent in our walk with Christ and take the action to serve him and his Father and only them. So be committed to Christ. Serve him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. If we trust in Jesus, we can go to him on a, and develop a personal relationship. We can bring all our burdens to him. We can bring our joys. We can bring our sorrows. We can bring our indifferences. Just have a conversation with him like you would have with your neighbor, with your friend, with your coworker. Because Jesus lives. Jesus is real. Jesus is alive and waiting for us to have those conversations and develop that relationship. Stay committed to Christ. Serve him with all your heart. Stay committed. It's through the relationship we will change the way we think and process information. It's through him that we will transform and want to live with him and his and with his father forever. <clears throat> when we do that, we will truly find the kingdom of heaven. If you want that relationship now, let's pray this prayer, and then I'll close out in our closing prayer. Dear Father, I want to give my life completely to you, Father God in heaven. I want to live the life that you have designed for me and only me, Father God in heaven. I want to put you first in my life. Father, forgive me of my sins so I may come to your throne of grace with a righteous heart and a righteous mind. Father, give me the strength to take this journey with you, Father God. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Empty me of this world, Father, that I may know you more. I may know you on a personal level. I may have you as my best friend. And I may, Father, live with you for eternity. Continue to work in me, Father God, and change my heart, change my mind, change my outlook in life that you may work through me and use me mightily in the kingdom of heaven to share your joy, your love, your peace with those who are hurting, those who are indifferent, Father, to share your kingdom of heaven with all those who have ears to hear. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the kingdom. And thank God that you have the courage to stand up and change your life through the Lord Jesus Christ and start working and putting him first. So let's close in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord, bring to my mind those things you want me to remember. Lord, bring to my heart those things you want to change in me. And Lord, bring to my lips the words you want me to speak for the rest of my days. Because, Father, you deserve all glory. You deserve reverence. You deserve our praise. You deserve our love, Father, for the act, for being the perfect sacrifice, Father. And we just thank you for that, Lord God in heaven. And we cannot express loudly enough, deeply enough, how much we love you, but more importantly, how much you love us and what you've done for us. So we just thank you, Jesus. We praise your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we all say amen. So have a wonderful uh, day today. Remember Palm Sunday. This is the day that Jesus rode in to Jerusalem. Five days later, six days later, he hangs on the cross. Three days later, he rises from the dead. It's a joyous season, a joyous occasion, and let's keep God first 
in our lives. Amen. So you all have a blessed day. Have a wonderful week. And stay in your word. Because God will do mighty works in you and through you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.